Hi, and welcome to this video abstract for our recent paper Carrying a Selfish Genetic Element Predicts Increased Migration Propensity in Free-Living Wild House Mice. My name is Janik Lasunge, and I'm one of the two authors of this paper. All life is based on genes, but one gene alone can't really do all that much. It needs to cooperate with other genes in a genome, which is the collection of all genes of an organism, to create something that's akin to what we know as organisms. But these genes don't just cooperate to create an organism. They also compete with each other. And that becomes very obvious when we think about plants and animals organisms that carry more than one copy of each gene. Because, as we all know, when two individuals reproduce, half of the genome of the father and half of the genome of the mother is passed on. Now, as a consequence, obviously, half the genomes are also not passed on, and they just don't get transmitted. Now, usually this is solved by simply having equal chances of being transmitted. And over many organisms and many individuals, this means that there's a fair chance to be transmitted for all genes. But some genes break the rules of this game. They increase their own chances to be transmitted. And that's why they're called selfish genes, because of course that means that other genes don't get passed on while these do. We study house mice and I'm going to use this illustration to show you the difference between a selfish gene and a quote-unquote normal gene to make it a bit more obvious. So in this case this blue gene that the male on the left side is carrying is a normal gene. It's being passed on at a chance of 50% to his offspring. This orange gene is a selfish gene and it's passed on to his offspring at a rate of up to 90%. In our case, this gene is called the T haplotype. This T haplotype only exists in house mice. It's not really just one gene, it's actually a super gene, a collection of genes which make this mechanism possible. So from now on I'm going to talk about a selfish supergene and I mean this T haplotype just to make it a bit more clear to understand. You can easily imagine what should happen to such a selfish supergene that manages to increase its transmission rate to such an extent. It should just be in all house mice. Every single mouse should carry this element, clearly. But that's not what we find. And so our research group has been focused on studying what prevents this selfish supergene from spreading to every mouse. First of all, in a mating between a male that carries the selfish supergene and a female that carries this selfish supergene, you obviously expect some of the offspring to carry it twice. But these offspring are not viable. They'll never be born. That's because this supergene has accumulated many deleterious mutations, which means that vital genetic information has been destroyed. And so if a mouse only carries this mutated region, it cannot live. That's of course immediately limiting the frequency of this supergene in a population. It can never replace the homologous chromosome, meaning the other chromosome that doesn't carry this selfish supergene. The other important drawback of this supergene becomes obvious in what's called multiple mating. Female house mice, like in many other animals, tend to mate with multiple males in the same estrus cycle, which means that the offspring in a litter 
will have multiple fathers. In such a mating, the supergene is very, very weak. It's sort of the opposite of what it's like when it's not in a multiple mating, but in a single mating. You can see here that two males reproduce with the same female. And what happens, of course, is that the sperm of these two males now compete over fertilization of the eggs in this female. And you can see that none of the offspring are fathered by the male that carries this supergene. So that's a very big disadvantage. This kind of mating is more common in larger populations of mice. More males mean that this becomes more likely. So when we take all this together, we spend a bit of time thinking about what could be the solution for this supergene. And here's our hypothesis. If you look at the top, you can see a very large population with many copies of that selfish supergene. In such a population, we'll have a higher chance that two mice that carry the supergene are reproducing, which is bad for this supergene because some of the offspring will die. And you also have a higher chance of multiple mating because the population is larger. So that's a very bad population for that supergene. On the bottom you can see a very small population where none of the mice actually carry this supergene. And in that case, the best kind of mating for this supergene, between a male that carries the supergene and a female that doesn't, is most likely. And so that's a very good population for the fitness of this supergene. So what we are proposing is that this supergene should be selected to increase the migration propensity of its carrier. So what we would expect is mice carrying this element to be more likely to leave their populations. Now we are testing all this in the mouse house. The mouse house is a population of free-living wild house mice uh, that are found near Zurich. And in this mouse house we have hundreds of mice living at any given moment. And they, they reproduce, they fight, they play, they leave if they want to leave. Uh, they live as naturally as possible. But we know a few things uh, about these mice. Because otherwise you would think, why on earth would we have a house full of mice? I mean, usually people try to get rid of mice. We don't. We have, as I said, a few mice in this house. Well, actually, it's more than just a few. It's, it's becoming a problem. It's a lot of mice. It's a lot of work. But thankfully, we can actually really learn quite a bit about the behavior uh, of these mice which uh, allows us to ask all sorts of questions. So what we know about them is, first of all, we have the genetic information of all mice. So we have an idea uh, about who's related to whom, who carries this selfish supergene. And what's important for this study, we can say, this young mouse, which is when we first take the sample when they're really young, became this adult and then later became this corpse, because of course the mice don't live forever. But what's so interesting, what we can use in our study is, some mice, they turn up as young mice, but they never show up as adults or corpses, which means they just disappear from the population. And we think they leave the population, because these mice can just leave the population anytime they want. So we will use that to look at the question that I've uh, explained to you earlier whether the mice are more likely to migrate if they carry this supergene. So we look at two different kinds of migration events. First of all, as I just said, mice that leave the mouse house when they're young. And also, because the population is divided into four sectors, um, and there's barriers between them, as you can see here. But these barriers are not perfect. The mice can, there are holes in the barrier so they can move between these sectors. Uh, and we're also interested in young mice that move between sectors because these are actual subpopulations of mice 
which is similar to leaving the entire population, so that we can look at this question from two very different uh, angles. And if we do that, we find that the mice that carry the selfish supergene are 50% more likely to leave the entire population, and they're also more likely to move within the population. But that's a bit harder to assess, because we had way fewer mice uh, to look at in this question, and so our sample size is limited, but both fits our hypothesis, our expectation, that I just explained to you before. So what this all leads us is that some selfish genes, they don't just break the rules of transmission, they also manipulate behavior. Thank you very much for watching this video abstract. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. Please don't hesitate to drop a comment if you have any questions. I will try to get to them as soon as possible. The entire paper can be found at Proceedings of the Royal Society B Biological Sciences. Just click on the link above, or if that doesn't work, look in the description. We have links to this paper and to other relevant papers that have been fundamental in this work there. I want to also thank uh, our funding sources. The University of Zurich, the Swiss National Science Foundation, the Promoter Foundation, the Julius Klaus Foundation and the Claris Foundation. Thank you very much. Take care.